Father, we love you. We thank you for all the evidence and all the greatness that you put around us, that you fill our life with, all the confidence and faith that you put around us and put in us, how you've blessed us and carried us and walked with us through all of these times in our life. We love you, Lord. We pray that the things that we say now, the things that we hear, the things that we experience will be a word from you, and we pray it in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen, 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 amen. All right, praise the Lord. Thank you, guys. That's so good. I love that. I love that. Uh, the evidence is all around us, and I know a lot of times it's, uh, it's not easy to see, and many times it, it looks like things are terrible or they're not getting any better, but God blesses our life. I look back at my life and I think, good night. All of these years, 40-something years, I mean, a long time, almost almost 50 years uh, I've been with the Lord, and it has been an amazing time, and God has always blessed me in so many ways, and at the moment, I might be a little bit apprehensive about it. I, I, I find myself uh, a lot like Naomi, and you'll see what I'm talking about today. We're going to read uh, some of the book of Ruth and look at it in connection with how God works trials in our life and then how God leads us through these things. And, uh, but Naomi is this whiny mother-in-law that everything that happens is almost like, oh, God's against me, and I can't, why have I been cursed by this, and so forth. And I, I, th I think a lot, when I was studying it this week, I thought, you know, that, that I'm a lot like that in, in, many, in many times in my life. I can be so dramatic about things, but God is blessed, and it, he just reminds me, and songs like this is just, uh, it just keeps me reminded of how God does in life. Uh, you know, last week, well, the last six or seven weeks, we were talking about following Jesus and what it means to really follow Jesus and what we can expect if we follow Jesus. And last week, uh, in, that, in the last message of that particular series, I shared a passage out of the book of James. And I want to start with that today, and I want to I, I kind of go with that a little bit, because it, it really does say a tremendous amount to us about how God brings us through things in life and what it actually does for us. Because very few things ever happen in life that... Um, that, that don't happen through some severity that goes on in our life. And here's what James says. James says in chapter one and in verse two, he says, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience, but let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. And I'm gonna go ahead and read the next verse, verse five. If any of you lacks wisdom, uh, about what? Well, about what he's just mentioned in these first, first uh, three verses up here. If any of you lacks wisdom about your trial or about what happens or what God's purpose is and this, that, then let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach and it'll be given to him. Now, I don't want you to think that you can ask God, you know what most of us ask when we're in a trial? Why? We ask the why question. Why, why, why is this happening to me? Uh, why can't I get over this? Why can't this be done or that be done? And, and, even, and I've thought about this many times because I've stood with families at funeral services, at gravesides, in the hospital, um, at, at tragedies, and, and, and the question is always, why? why? Why is this going? And I've always thought, you know, if God told us why, would it, would it matter? I mean, would it make any difference if he told us why? We probably wouldn't understand it anyway. We, it wouldn't, it, it, we would never get the concept of that. But the point is, uh, if we ask God the why question, have you noticed that God never answers a why question? I, I've never had a single one of them ever answered in life. And I've never, I don't see anything in the scripture that ever answers a why question. But so if you're, if you're seeking wisdom about why something's happening, then you can forget. This verse is not promising you that God's gonna tell you why this is going on. It just says that if you need wisdom to make it through, if you need wisdom to carry forward, if you need wisdom to know how to respond, then you ask God and he's gonna give it to you and he's not even gonna get on to you about it. He's not gonna upbraid you. He's not gonna chastise you for asking the question. So what do you do 
when your faith gets tested. I mean, wouldn't it be great if God would um, help us cram for this test? I don't know how many of you guys were students a lot of your life. I, I was for, gosh, I don't know, Tanya, what, uh, 20 years, something like that. I was a student. <laughs> I, spent, I spent a lot of time in school all the way up through. And, um, and you know, I, I know a lot of people that uh, crammed for tests. Uh, I really wasn't one that could do that effectively, but I know a lot of my friends, man, they would just cram. And wouldn't it be great if God gave us the ability to cram for the test of life, for a faith test in life? Like, like God would just give you a kind of a heads up about, about something that's on the horizon. Like, hey, you know, I know you're thinking about buying a bunch of new stuff. I think you. I, I know you're thinking about uh, getting in some debt and taking out some loans and so forth. Uh, you might not better do that. As a matter of fact, uh, in a few months you're going to have this tremendously big financial crisis, and so what I would suggest to you is that you would pay off all the notes that you could pay off, uh, put a little money in savings, maybe memorize Philippians 4:19 that says, "My God shall supply all your needs according to His riches and glory," because uh, you're going to need it. You got a big test coming. Get ready for it. But unfortunately, that's not how tests come, do they? James says in this second verse, he says, uh, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall. Not if. That means they're certainly coming. When it, when it happens, not if it happens. And it's going to happen suddenly because he said, when you fall, into various trials. You, you don't step in, you don't back in, you don't, you, you, you fall suddenly. They just come upon you. And they're going to be various. That means they're not all going to be alike. They're going to have different avenues. Some of them are going to be big tests. Some of them are going to be small tests, which I think personally can actually be tougher than maybe the big test of life. Some of them are going to be ongoing. They're going to last a long time, and some of them are going to be momentary. You know, difficult situations, uh, personal crisis, health crisis, uh, finances, family. I mean, it could even be a person that could be your test. Now, don't, don't look at them. Uh, it's kind of tacky. Uh, but, but it could be a person because the Bible is filled with many persons and and, and combinations of person that sh surely it was a test for them. Like, I mean, at the very beginning, you had Abraham and Sarah. They were old. Both of them were extremely old. Sarah was 90 years old, and she's still praying for God to send them a child. And God does. God says, hey, I'm gonna, you're going to be with child. She's 90 years old. And Sarah laughed about it, you know. And God said, go ahead and laugh. As a matter of fact, they named the child laughter. They named him Isaac, which means laughter. Uh, so Isaac was really the punchline, I guess, to the joke. And then Isaac and Rebecca, that uh, you remember when they were traveling and they were going uh, as God directed them, and they went to a couple of places that they felt uh, Sarah, uh, uh, Rebecca was so beautiful, even though she was way on up in years. And Isaac said, this is my sister. And they introduced her as his sister twice, as a matter of fact. And Abraham and Lot, Abraham and his nephew Lot, and Lot chooses Sodom. He pitched his tent toward Sodom. And Moses and Aaron, Moses is up on the mountain receiving the Ten Commandments from God, and his brother Aaron is down in the camp of Israel building a golden calf so they can worship and dance around. These are conflicts. Jesus and his disciples. <laughs> o ye of little faith, Jesus said to them. Paul and Barnabas, I know you probably hadn't heard much about Paul and Barnabas, but they were a missionary team, the Apostle Paul and Barnabas. And Barnabas had a little nephew named John Mark that ended up writing one of the books of the New Testament, the book of Mark. And John Mark went with them on a missionary journey, and then he got there and decided he needed to go back home. And the Apostle Paul called him a quitter for the rest of his life. And Paul and Barnabas kind of split up the missionary team because of that. Barnabas wanted to take him. Paul said, I'm not taking that quitter anywhere with me. Peter and Paul before Mary. Uh, I know you guys, you guys, you guys, you guys on the on the camera there. You don't know most of these people that are sitting in here are probably old enough to remember Peter, Paul, and Mary. But anyway, Peter and Paul. You know, Peter well, became the apostle to the Gentiles, 
and he would be ministering to a Gentile family, and the Cadillac from Jerusalem would pull up out front, and Peter would run out the back door. The Apostle Paul said, man, you can't do that. No, 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 you, you're playing games. In other words, I, I, you get the point. Um, relationships can be a real challenge in life. And one of the relationships that has always intrigued me is one that you find in the little book of Ruth. It's a relationship between a mother-in-law named Naomi and her daughter-in-law named Ruth. And they have this tremendously unique relationship. The book of Ruth is about, the whole, a couple of things the book of Ruth is about. It's about, it's a wonderful picture of how Christ redeems all of us who trust him. Boaz in the book, the kin, he's called the kinsman redeemer. He's the one that, that's kin to you that redeems you. And he's a perfect picture of Christ and how Christ redeems and cares for those who love him. It's also a book about choices. And the book basically teaches if you make expected choices, you're gonna get expected results. If you make exceptional choices, then you're gonna get ex, uh, extraordinary results. And that's a whole sermon in itself. But because of a famine, a, a, a man by the name of Elimelech and his wife, Naomi, and their two sons, Malan and Chilion, move from Bethlehem to a city called Moab. And we're gonna pick up reading in the first chapter, verse three. Then Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died. And she was left and her two sons. Now they took wives of the women of Moab. The name of one was Orpah and the name of the other, Ruth. And they dwelt there about 10 years. Then both Malan and Chilion also died. So the, the woman survived her two sons and her husband. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law that she might return from the country of Moab for she had heard in the country of Moab that the Lord had visited his people by giving them bread. In other words, the famine's over. And Naomi says, uh, I'm going back home to my people. And this was not, it, this was not an uncommon thing. It wasn't, and it wasn't uncommon. It was common custom for the daughter-in-law to go with her husband's family if he died. And so what's happening here is completely customary and so forth. But here's Naomi. Then she arose with her daughter-in-law that she might return. Verse seven, therefore she went out from the place where she was and her two daughters-in-law with her and they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. So there's no reason to stay in Moab. Her husband's dead. Her two sons are dead. She has no family there. And now she has two daughters-in-law that are staying with her. And she says, let's go back to Jerusalem, uh, back to Bethlehem. So they strike out for Bethlehem. Verse eight, and Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, go return to each your mother's house. The Lord dealt kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find rest each in the house of her husband. In other words, you... You're young enough, get a husband, and, and may the Lord bless you in that, and you have peace. So she kissed them, and they lifted up their voices and wept. And they said to her, surely we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Are there still sons in my wombs that they may be your husbands? Turn back, my daughters. Go, for I'm too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, if, if, if I should have a husband tonight and should also bear sons, would you wait for them till they were grown? Would you restrain yourselves from having husbands? No, my daughters, for it grieves me very much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. It is, you don't have to wonder what Naomi thinks about, about what God's done, right? <laughs> he, he's, God has cursed me and leave, please go away. Verse 14, then they lifted up their voices and wept again, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. So Orpah leaves, and Ruth clings to her, and she said, look, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. Then Ruth makes this beautiful announcement that is read at many, many weddings. Ruth said, entreat me not. 
or turn back from following after you. For wherever you go, I will go. And wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me and more also, if anything but death parts you and me. When Naomi saw that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped speaking to her. Now, it doesn't mean she stopped speaking about everything. It means she stopped telling her, go back. She just stopped all that. Now, the two of them went until they came to Bethlehem. All right, I want us to talk about some choices that you have when you find yourself in a test. Uh, three of them, obviously. That's my magic number, it seems like. Three of them. And here's the first one. The first one is, am I loyal or am I a lever? When you find yourself in a test from the Lord, the, que the one question becomes, all right, am I going to remain loyal and stick with the Lord in spite of the fact that I'm in this terrible trial and it seems as if he's forsaken me and forgotten me, am I going to be loyal or am I going to be a lever? Of course, Ruth stayed and Orpah left. Now, loyalty is, it, it seems to be really um, a lost virtue nowadays. I, I, don't, I don't know if you've noticed this, but it, it's loyalty nowadays to me. And I, I, and I consider myself a very loyal person, and loyalty means a lot to me. And I try to be a loyal person. But in this age of social media, it just seems like people just, uh, they follow people and they unfollow people and they friend people and they unfriend people. And, they, you know, and, and if you find out somebody unfriended you, then you say, well, I'm going to certainly unfriend him. You know, <clears throat> and it just seems like that loyalty is something that is uh, hard to give, but it's easy to expect. We all expect everyone to be loyal to us, but it's really very difficult in difficult situations to, uh, to give loyalty because in order to be loyal, you have to, you have to grow. You have to, you have to have come to a point in your life where you can say, hey, this is not all about me uh, it, 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 or what other people can do for me. This is, this is, this is something that, uh, what can I do? How can I stay? But that's why James says in the passages that we just read that we should consider it all a joy in life when we find that we're in a trial of life because that trial is going to do something for us that we can't have done in any other way. That trial is going to push some endurance. It's going to push some patience. And, and that patience is going to do something in us that can't be done in other ways. That patience is going to create, create a certain level of maturity in us so that when things get bad, we can stay loyal because we've grown past the point of what can you do for me or how can you help me or how is this going to benefit me? And you've grown to the point where you can say, what can I do for you? I can't tell you in all these 40 plus years of ministry I've had, how many people I have had leave me. I mean, it would be amazing. And, and you guys in here right now, you know this because you guys have been here a, a pretty good time with us. Uh, I'll guarantee you in the 13 years that we've been Freedom River Church, if we had everybody still with us that, that have been with us along the way, we'd have to be meeting in the Coliseum down there. Uh, we've had so many people that walk in and say, oh, it's the greatest thing I've ever heard. I love it, I love it, love it. Never see them again. Well, that's the lever mentality of life. Like, hey, wh why are you going? Well, you know, I'm just not getting what I, what I think I need. Uh, well, hadn't you been here 10 years? Yeah. Well, has it ever dawned on you that you should be part of the bunch that's feeding, not part of the bunch that's being fed, right? But you have to grow to that. You have to grow to a level of maturity. And, 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 and Ruth's response is the essence of loyalty. She says, look, your people are going to be my people. Your mall is going to be my mall. <laughs> your yard sale is going to be my yard sale. You know, your, your recipe is going to be my recipe. She's being ultimately loyal. So Ruth chooses loyalty, and loyalty has a tremendous benefit. 
in Proverbs chapter three. Let me just read it to you. Or Tanya put it on the screen. In verse three, don't lose your grip on love and loyalty. Tie them around your neck. Carve their initials on your heart. Earn a reputation for living well in God's eyes and in the eyes of people. What does that say? And it said, look, love and loyalty are a great benefit to you because if you won't let them slip away from you, tie them around your neck, carve them you know, in your heart. Don't lose them because what they do for you is give you a great position with God and with all the other people around you. So, wow, here's Ruth. Bless her heart. She's passed the test, right? Oh, whew, glad that thing's over with. Now we can move on. Well, not so fast. Uh, let's look at verse 19. Now, the two of them went until they came to Bethlehem. I'm reading verse 19. And, and it happened when they had come to Bethlehem that all the city was excited because of them. And the, and the women said, is this Naomi? They hadn't seen her in a long time. Is this Naomi? But she said to them, do not call me Naomi. Naomi, by the way, means pleasant. Don't call me pleasant. Call me Mara. Mara means bitter. Is this Naomi? Naomi. Don't call me Naomi. Call me Mara. For the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went out full, and the Lord has brought me home again. Empty. Why do you call me Naomi since the Lord has testified against me and the Almighty has afflicted me? I, I, I just read that to you so that you can see how whiny Naomi is. This is a whiny mother-in-law. This is a person that's hard to love, I'm, I'm submitting to you. Have you ever had any, and please don't look at them, but have you had anybody in your life that's whiny? They're difficult people to, to deal with, Right? And, and yet, here's Ruth. Ruth is staying with someone. Ruth is being loyal to someone that is, that is, that's hard to love. So it's a tough season in her life. Tested, I, I, I can either be loyal or I can be a lever. Here's a, here's a second, uh, a second um, choice you can make. Am I consistent or am I a controller? When I'm being tested in life, especially with another person, but it doesn't have to be. It could be anything, but especially with another person. I, got a, I have a choice. I can either be consistent like God has created me to be uh, in relationship to other people, or I can be a control freak. Now, let me show you here uh, about this difficult situation. All right, here's, here's Naomi, and we've read... We've read it, so you've heard her. She's convinced that God is out to get her, that he has moved against her, and that she doesn't please him, and so he's not husbands and her son-in-laws from dying, and this is just a horrible time, and she's just, you know, she's almost given up on life. She told her friends, don't call me pleasant, call me bitter, because God, and, and this is a difficult people, like whiny people, difficult hurting people are, are hard to deal with. So, uh, let me give you a suggestion. After 40 plus years of dealing with people, a lot of people, and I know this is gonna be very difficult if you are a control freak. If you're a control freak, just kind of batten the hatches and strap it down. And I hope you'll listen because I, I wanna make a suggestion here and, this, and it's gonna sound, I'm sure at first, you're gonna say, what are you talking about, what? But I promise you that if you'll listen to everything I say about this on this, this particular point here, uh, I do have a point, and, and, and I just want us, I want us all to, to hear this about, about being a controller in life, especially with other people. If you have somebody in your life that is difficult, they're hurting, they're trying, you know, they're... They just, but they, 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 can't, they can't seem to get it all together and, 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 and you're with them and you're trying to stay faithful and you're trying to stay consistent with them. My suggestion to you is that you quit trying to change them. If you read this story from beginning to end, you will not find one time 
when Ruth tries to change Naomi. She doesn't interrogate her. She doesn't suggest things to her. She doesn't lecture to her. How does Ruth handle this person? She just consistently lives a life of service to Naomi, sacrifice, and she becomes a, a great help for Naomi or old Mara, you know. Here's Ruth 2, verse 1. There was a relative of Naomi's husband's husband, a man of great wealth of the family of Elimelech. His name was Boaz. So Ruth, the Moabitess, said to Naomi, please let me go to the field and glean heads of grain after him in whose sight I might find favor. And she said to her, go, my daughter. All right, let me see if I can help us a second. If Ruth had been typical, what would Ruth have done to Naomi when Naomi starts whining and complaining and griping about all of these things? I submit to you that if Ruth had been typical, that she would have launched into a sermon about how you can't blame God for every bad thing that happens in your life, and you just need to hang on to some faith because God's going to take these terrible things and God's going to work all these things to the good. Tremendous message about that, and all that's true, but she could have done that, and she would have obviously launched into that. But Ruth doesn't do that, so what does it show to us? It, it shows that Ruth's ability to love a difficult person doesn't depend on her ability to change that person. When your faith is being tested by difficult people, stop trying to change them. And I'll go, I'll go a little bit further than that. Stop hoping they'll change. Have you ever been somebody that's been tried to be controlled by someone else who's wanting you to be different than you are? Do, do, you, do you know, you can even feel it. They may not even be saying anything to you about what they want you to do and putting pressure on you to become what they want. You, but, but it just comes across subtle, subtly. And what I'm saying is that we must have a, a funeral for our expectations of this, of this person. In other words, you, you, you got to let go of the idea that they're ever going to change and realize that the only person that I can change is myself. And that the way I choose to respond to those who are troubled, who are hurting, who are different, who are difficult to me, that, that I can't do anything to change that spirit. Now, let me clarify, I'm not talking about you quit praying for them that God will do something to change them. I'm not saying give up hope that God's going to do something in their life. I'm just saying that you need to give up the idea that you're going to do anything in their life that's going to change them or that somehow God needs your help to change people in life. In other words, if this is a test, keep your eyes on your own paper because you're the only one that you have choices to make about. And God's not asking you to change someone. You know what he's asking you to do? He's just asking you to respond to them in a godly way. He's just asking you to reflect him to them. He's not asking you to change people. So when I'm having a difficult trial, especially if it involves a person, I have a choice. Am I going to remain consistent and love them in spite of the fact that I can't change them? And say, look, it, whether you change or not, I'm committed to this relationship and I'm going to stick I'm going to stick with you and I'm not going to leave you and I'm not going to forsake you even if you don't become what I think you ought to become. And I'm going to be praying and I'm going to ask God to change all of these things to his direction and I'm just going to try to love you in a godly way and be an example of how the love of God works in a person's life. Which leads us to the third choice, the last choice, and it, it is, am I a gleaner? Or am I a griper? Ruth 2, verse 3. 
Then she left and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the family of Elimelech, her, her former father-in-law. So to glean means to extract or to remove. And gleaning was a custom of the day in which the poor people were allowed to follow the reapers into the fields. And after the reapers had, had, had gathered all of the, the, the grain or the or whatever they, were, whatever they were picking or gleaning, once they had made one pass through the field, the custom was that you would leave what was left for the poor people so that the poor people could come in and whatever was left in the field, they could reap it and they could keep it for themselves. Now, I say this because I don't know about you, but about myself, a lot of times in the test that God brings across through the paths of my life, I don't, I don't want to remove or extract. I, I want to wallow. Uh, and I can be quite dramatic at it, actually. God... Why is this happening to me? I've done nothing all my life but serve you. I've given you everything I've had, all my money, all my time, my resources. I've given my life for you. I've sacrificed everything for you. And what have I gotten out of it? Nothing. Raw deal, God, raw deal. Yeah, I can be a real griper. A whiny mother-in-law, uh, Ruth has a whiny mother-in-law. She could have easily said, you know, if I had just gone back to my parents, you know, I'm sure that would have made everything okay. Yeah, as if an adult child moving back in with their parents is going to fix anything. But it's, it's really easy to jump on the pity pot. But the truth is God promotes gleaners and God resists gripers. Isn't that what James says in chapter four? We read, him, read his verses in the first chapter. I don't, this is not on the slide, Ted. Uh, we read what he said in the first about count it all joy, but in, in chapter four, he says, God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. He's saying, look, I'm, I'm not gonna bless the gripers. I'm gonna bless the gleaners in life. And so uh, as an example, the journey that Israel made uh, from Egypt to the promised land. Do you, know, do you know how many miles it was from Egypt where, they, where Pharaoh let them go and Moses is leading them? How many miles it was actually to Canaan, which is the promised land? About 250 miles. It would take the average person about 11 days to walk from Egypt to the promised land. How long did it take Israel to get there? 40 years. Why did it take so long? Because every time something happened, all they did was gripe and complain and accuse Moses. It's too hot. Moses, have you let us out in the wilderness to die? We don't have enough food. We have too much food. <laughs> it's too cold out here. We don't have any water. They're giants in the land. All Israel did the whole way, instead of, instead of choosing uh, to be a gleaner in life, evidently their philosophy was, when in doubt, uh, gripe and complain. A gleaner, when, when a farmer would, would, would plant a seed, you know, a, you know what a gleaner would do? A gleaner would get his sickle and sleep, and sleep with him because his idea would be, hey, this seed is going to surely come up and I'm gonna, I need to be ready to, to glean this thing. In other words, the gleaner is a person that looks at life, uh, if you want to put it in a kind of a modern analogy, uh, the glass is half full. Gripers always see the glass half empty. A gleaner has moved past the why question. To the, to the how question in life. God, uh, how am I going to do this? What do you want me to do? Where do you want me to go? What am I going to do here? What, it, what is it that you have for me here? Because gleaners know that we not only have to take life's test, we have to pass life's test. What happens when you pass a test? 
Well, verse 12 of chapter one, James says it this way, and it's really the title of this message. Blessed is the man. By the way, what does blessed mean? Blessed is the Greek word, markerios. You remember what it means. I preached on the beatitude, blessed is the man that walketh not. You know, blessed is the man, blessed are you, blessed are you. Uh, it, means, it means happy. That's what it means, happy. So here's James says, happy is the man who endures the trial. For when he has been approved, everybody say, he passed the test. So when he passed the test, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. So God who doesn't grade on the curve and you don't get blessed and mature just because you get older in life, when you pass the test, According to James, it brings the blessing in your life. So watch this in, in chapter two, Ruth. Then she left and she went and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And she happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the family of Elimelech. Now behold, Boaz came from, Baru, uh, from Bethlehem and said to the reapers, the Lord be with you. And they answered him, the Lord bless you. Then Boaz said to his servant who was in charge of the reapers, whose young woman is this? So the servant who was in charge of the reapers answered and said, it is the young Moabite woman who came back with Naomi from the country of Moab. And she said, please let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. So she came and has continued from morning until now, though she rested a little while in the house. Then Boaz said to Ruth, you will listen, my daughter, will you not? Do not go and glean in another field, nor go from here, but stay close to my young women. Let your eyes be on the field which they reap and go after them. Have I not commanded the young men not to touch you? And when you're thirsty, go to the vessels and drink from, from what the young men have drawn. So she fell on her face, bowed down to the ground and said, why have I found favor in your eyes that you should take notice of me since I'm a foreigner? And Boaz answered and said, it's been fully reported to me all that you've done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband and how you left your father and your mother in the land of your birth and you've come to a people whom you did not know before. The Lord repay your work and a full reward be given you by the Lord God of Israel. I love this line, under whose wings you have come for refuge. Then she said, let me find favor in your sight, my Lord, for you have comforted me and spoken kindly to your maidservant, though I'm not like one of your maidservants. What, what, what's, the, what's the point here? The point is that if Ruth had left Naomi, she would have never found Boaz. Ruth had Naomi as a test. Naomi was a test for Ruth. In one season of, of her life, this whiny mother-in-law that was getting old and was feeling sorry for herself, this was a test for Ruth. And if Ruth had left her, she would have never found Boaz. So Ruth passed the test. And when Ruth passed the test in one season of her life, Boaz was the reward for her life in the next season of her life. See, life is filled with tests and blessings. And what I have found is you rarely see one without the other. As a matter of fact, I, I, I really believe that it is the test of life that put you in position to receive the blessings in life. So how did it work out for Ruth? Is it, I mean, is this theory true? How did it work out for her? Let, let's just skip to the end, to the last chapter, Ruth 4, verse 13. So Boaz, and there's, there, there are lots of drama there. If you want to read, this is a short book. It's a wonderful little book. It has some great, great insights in it. And, but here's the end. Verse 13, so, so Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife. And when he went into her, the Lord gave her conception and she bore a son. So Ruth and Boaz, 
blessed each other with a son. Verse 14, then the women said to Naomi, uh, blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a close relative and may his name be famous in Israel. So Naomi gets blessed. Verse 15, and may he be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age for your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is better to you than seven sons has borne him. Then Naomi took the child and she laid him on her bosom and became a nurse to him. Also, the neighbor women gave him a name saying, there's a grandson born to Naomi and they called his name Obed. By the way, Obed means serving. And they called his name Obed. He is the father of Jesse, the father of David. What, wait, what? He is the father, he's the father of Jesse, the father of of David, what you mean? Ruth is the Ruth is the is the is the great grandmother of David, the king, and Naomi is the great great grandmother of David, the king. How, how could this happen? Well, they passed the test, and when they passed the test, they received the crown. Now, this is, a, this is a notable blessing, and, it, and, and it's quite a crown, but God's not finished yet. Watch this. The, book of, the Gospel of Matthew is written to show that Jesus is the king of kings, and he's the king of the Jews. Every king has to have a genealogy. This is why the book of Matthew contains in the first chapter the genealogy of Jesus. And it traces it through David and, uh, as a king's genealogy. And I'm going to pick up reading at verse 4. The first 10 or 12 verses are just genealogies, but I'm going to pick up at 4, and, 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 and I want to show you something. Ram begot Amenadab. Amenadab begot Nashon, and Nashon begot Salmon. Salmon begot Boaz by Rahab. Boaz begot Obed by Ruth. And Obed begot Jesse, and Jesse begot David the king. Boaz, what's the big deal about that? Well, according to the law of inheritance of the day, if you were a kinsman who married a widow from your family that's been widowed by someone in your family and you are a kinsman and you marry her so that she can have a heritage and a family, that if there are any children that are born in that union, that the children don't take the name of the new husband, but they take the name of the former husband, her first husband. So Boaz is in the lineage, but he shouldn't be there. Why? Because the child was to bear the name of Malan, who Ruth was married to. So this would have been, Malan's name should have been there, right? Well, I guess God said, throw that name out. Uh, Boaz, put Boaz's name in. I'm, I'm, I'm breaking all, these, all the laws because this, cup, this couple has been exceptional. And because they've been exceptional, I'm going to give them the extraordinary. You know, this happened over 3,000 years ago, and we're, and we're still reading about it. And when we get to heaven one day, we're going, to meet, we're going to meet Obed and Boaz and Ruth, and we're going to have the privilege of, of enjoying their fellowship. And, and why is this? Because they let patience perfect them, and they pass the test. Now, these are the tests in life. This is what they do. This is how we pass these tests in life. Oh, they're difficult, yeah. They're discouraging, of course they are. Um, they're hard to deal with, yes. We get frustrated and annoyed, yes. But, but tests change us. Tests mature us. Tests perfect us so that our life becomes better. It becomes deeper. It becomes richer. And... It is only the test of life that really can produce this in our life. So anyway, praise the Lord for that. Let's bow and let's have a word.